Welcome everybody to the Mathagon webinar on exploring data science with virtual manipulatives. My name is David Porras. I am a seventh grade math teacher outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I teach in Weston and I live in Newton and I'm the head of content for Mathagon. Uh, I will switch screens here. And as you can see, I'm at mathagon.org. That's where I'll be spending our time tonight. Mathagon is a mathematical playground where we make online learning interactive and engaging. And I'm really excited to share with you uh, some of the tools tonight, how we can do this with data science. Um, Mathagon is free for all for teachers and students around the world. So everything I'm doing tonight is free and open to everybody. We, um, I'm seeing folks in the chat put their, put their name and their location in the world. So if you're just joining us, you can drop that in as well. We have many things on Mathagon. We have courses, Polypad, activities, and a whole section for teachers. I'm gonna spend our time tonight on Polypad, which is our virtual manipulatives. And the first thing, just, just to get our math brain going tonight, I'm gonna to do a quick warm up that uh, uses a few of, of the data science tools. Um, I will show you where you can find this link after we do the activity. But I, as you can see here, I, ha I have 10 cards on the canvas and three dice, a balance scale and a number line. So uh, a range of the tools that we have, I will show you how to build these types of canvases on Polypad as we get going. But just to get us going here, I'm going to turn over the 10 cards. You'll notice that on Polypad, if you click on an object, additional options appear at the bottom of the canvas. So one of the options was turn over when I've selected all these cards. I'm gonna stack them. So it shows me there are 10 cards in the stack. I'm gonna shuffle them a few times. You can see I'm clicking shuffle a few times. And then I, I, I'm gonna draw a top card. And I'm gonna put that in one side of the scale. And then I also can draw a card by doing a double click. So I'll put that on this side of the scale. And if you'd like to play along in your head or in the YouTube chat, feel free right now to put your prediction in the chat. What do you think the two cards are? They were the cards one through 10. I shuffled them a few times and drew two cards off the top. So if you'd like to drop in the chat what you think those two cards are, go for it. And then I'm gonna take a, a, a single die and put it on the balance scale. And we can see it didn't change the balancing of the scale. Those two cards are, stu are still are heavier than two. But if I click on, on, on the die, one of the options is a randomized button at the bottom and I can roll the dice on the scale. And I got four. So feel free as this is going, if you want to update your prediction in the chat, feel free to do so. I got five. Let's spin it one more time. Maybe it's time to add another uh, die on the scale. So now I have two of them, two dice, which is nine, did not change the scale. So let me spin it again. Let's see what we got. Ooh, ah, we got 10. So the scale balanced at 10. I was hoping to do a few more before it got balanced. So you could update your prediction now if you'd like in the chat uh, as to what you think the two cards could be. But we know it balances with 10. I will turn them over. That is eight. And then you could make a prediction for what this other card is. I turn that over and there's the, eight and the two. And then um, there was an idea from a teacher on Twitter that was doing this with her class. I could take these cards and leave them off to the side and do it again knowing that the eight and two are gone. Uh, or, and so now we can see that those are heavier than 10. Um, or you could stack all the cards up again. I'm gonna turn it over. I can select all the cards and stack them again, shuffled a few times and do this again as a warm up. I did this in class uh, one day last week um, with my seventh graders and they enjoy just kind of trying to predict what the cards were at the bottom is a number line and if you wanted to ex expand the green bars to show the numbers that it can't be based on on information that is coming up in the scale that's a scaffold you could provide to students if you think that would be helpful for them so just a fun warm-up i'm seeing in the chat some people got uh put their predictions in thanks for thanks for playing along i'm going to show you where you can find this task so if you click on on polypad again i was at mathagon.org i was on polypad I don't need to save this. And one of the links at the top is for teachers. And in the for teachers page, there's a section on lesson plans. And that'll take you to mathagon.org slash tasks. Again, I'll just show you how I found that. I was on Polypad. I clicked on for teachers and clicked on the lesson plans. 
And in there is over a hundred lesson plans, puzzles, games, tutorials, all sorts of great activities that uh, engage students on Polypad. And in the third row, there's one called Class Openers and Math Talks. And in this section on Class Openers and Math Talks, here's that first one, what are the two cards? So you could pull it up and do this activity with students. So that could be a, a fun way just to start a math class and have fun students trying to predict what the two cards were. We are here tonight to explore some of the data, uh, the data science tools. So I want to pull up a lesson in our task page and it's called what chart is best. I'm not going to go through the whole lesson plan. You can go on your own and read it, but here's where you'd find the link to the activity I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to click on the, on the, on the task called what chart is best. I'm not going to read through this. I just want a link to this polypad. So here's a polypad. I've got the link. I'm going to zoom in with the uh, tools on the right to zoom in. And here's a data table that I made based on the Tokyo 2020, 2021 Summer Olympics, depending on what year we'd like to call the um, Olympics. And I always think it's fun to think about which country like won the Olympics. And so here's a table that I made based on the final medal count for the top five countries. USA, China, Japan, Great Britain, and ROC, the, the Russian Olympic Committee, I think is what that stood for this past summer. And so here's a data table. I will show us in a little bit how to make a data table. The task here for students would be to explore which chart they think best represents this data and put it on the canvas, and which chart they think worst represents the data. And I'm going to use this as a way to show off some of the data tools that we have on Polypath. So on Polypad, there is a menu on the left. There's a, a tile panel here. We have geometry tiles and number tiles, fractions, algebra, probability and data. We'll be spending most of our time here and tools and axes. And so in the probability and data, I'm going to click on charts and statistics. And I'm going to start with a column chart. I can get this on the canvas just by doing a click and drag. Or if I click on the column chart, it'll just appear on the canvas. So here is a general star to the column chart. And the way that you link the, the table to the chart is if I click on the table, you'll see a blue triangle appears. So when the table is not selected, it's just the table. I could click on a cell and I could change this to something else. I'm not going to, but I could edit the cells. But then if I click on the table as a whole, you'll, you'll see this blue triangle appears. And that's like an arrow that I can move all around the canvas. I want to attach it to this chart. So you can see when that, when that arrow touches the chart, it has graphed the data for me. So there is um, the medals of all five of the countries. Now, I'd love it if that red bar would be gold because it's the gold medal. So if I double click on a bar, you can see all the red bars got selected and there's a color picker on the bottom and I will pick the pre-selected colors. That one does not look very gold. Let's go to that one, it looks kind of gold. If I really wanted to um, to change the colors, there's a there's a slider here where I could do the RGB value. I could find the RGB value for gold, and so on. This bottom slider is a a transparency slider, so I don't want these to be transparent. But I could if I wanted to. I'll double click on the blue and make that kind of silver, and double click on the green and maybe maybe that's kind of the bronze. There we go, gold, silver, bronze. And I might stop here and have a conversation with students of like, what do you notice? What do you wonder about the data, right? Who won, do you think? Do you think uh, the United States won based on this data? What, what other information can we tell about the graph? When I click on the chart, as you'll see, additional options appear at the bottom. And one option is going from a column chart to a row chart. So there we go, it's the same data, just as rows. But what I think is a really nice feature here is the ability to go from a grouped column chart to a stacked column chart to a percentage column chart. And I, I, I picked this data here. I didn't make up the data. These are the actual uh, metal counts. But I think each chart tells a very different story. Again, if I were doing this in school, I'd have students making the charts on their own and recording what they notice and wonder. I'm just going to share with you what I sort of notice and wonder. You're welcome to put them into the chat as well. But if I go from a group chart to a stacked chart, that's a really nice visual of the total medals, the total number of medals, which wasn't really shown in the table. That maybe if I were to rank these five countries based on total number of medals, these, th these three would be different where in a grouped chart, I might be able to 
piece that together, I certainly could do some calculations to find the total here. But I really like that it's so easy to change from a grouped chart to a stacked chart. And this tells to me a very different story just based on the, on, on the chart that I chose. And then if I go to the percentage chart, maybe before I click it, you, you could think about which country do you think had the highest percentage of gold medals. And then I click on it and we see that really clearly. So maybe we could make an argument that it's better to have a higher percentage of gold medals and that uh, Japan was the winner of the 2020 or 21 Summer Olympics, right? So really easy for students to go back and forth between grouped stacked and a percentage chart and each one with this data tells a very different story um, and I, I think that's really helpful for students to be able to to talk about the story that's told based on the chart as well as go back and forth um, with ease and then I could change this to a line chart which really doesn't make a lot of sense here it's hard to even think about what that's telling us either group stacked or percentage an area chart also doesn't make a lot of sense here to represent the data that is shown in the table. So maybe students would take one of these and put that under the worst chart option, right? But let's go back to a column chart and maybe I'll leave it in, in percentage mode. So that's how the column chart works. I have another set of data, which is the top 10 uh, women's and men's uh, top records in the 400 meter hurdles. A line chart would be very nice for that. I'm gonna skip that for the purposes of this webinar. Uh, I showed you where to find this link so you can play on your own if you want. But I wanna to go to the continent of Olympic games from 1972 to 2021. And here I could put a pie chart on. I just wanna show you how the pie charts work. I could make it bigger if I wanted to. And then the same thing, when I click on, on the table, this blue triangle appears and I can attach that to the chart, right? Um, we currently don't have the ability to make uh, a row of a table a different color to match up with the colors in the chart. That is coming soon to a polypad near you. I could make, you know, make changes to the colors if I wanted to, but I actually kind of like right here at this moment in time in polypad where the colors aren't matched up, Students might not be sure where the eight, the nine, and the seven is. I can make a guess by looking at it, which one looks bigger, smaller, or the same, but it's a good opportunity for them to, to try to figure out on their own which one is Asia, which one is Europe, and which one is North America. And it's a good opportunity to show off our protractor tool. So under uh, the category of geometry on the left, I went to the measuring tools and here's the protractor and what is really nice here everything kind of snaps into place so you can see as i drag the protractor onto the pie chart that just kind of snaps into place i can feel it as i'm putting it in maybe you can see it if i make the protractor smaller you can see it snaps in place to the size of the pie chart i can spin this around and it seems like that is about 110 degrees on the red one right that 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 red piece is about 110 degrees. I'll go to a text box and I'll label that 110 degrees. I'm still on the, the, the gold color. I could make that white so it really stands out nicely. And then I could take the protractor and rotate it all the way over here to try to get a measure of that section that's yellow. That looks to be about 96 or 97. So I could go to my text box tool and label that with the number of degrees. 97 degrees and then do the same one over here and now I'm getting a sense of the sizes of these regions and that looks to be about 125 or so I could move this over and make it a little bit nicer and then here we're labeling this one as 125 degrees and now I can see right that the smallest one is is the 97 that's North America I could take my text tool and even label this North America and so on, right? What's nice is if you change the number in the chart, the data changes automatically as well. So if in a few years we need to update this chart, you can see when I update it, the chart uh, changes as well, which I think is, uh, is a nice feature. So that's a quick overview of the chart tools. I wanna to go back to our task page and share some other ideas with you. Um, if at any point in the webinar you have questions, please drop them in the chat. I will be looking at the chat as I go. At the end of the webinar, I will stay and answer any questions that you have, even if they're not about the data science tools. So we'll have time at the end to do a big question and answer session. But I'm gonna go back to mathagon.org slash tasks. Again, you can find that, that 
under four teachers. Oh, actually, I'm going to go to Polypad because I have a graph. I want to, I have an activity to, sh to share with you. I'll show you where you can find it on the task page on your own. But I'm going to go to File. So here I've been in, in the Tile panel. File is where you can create a Polypad and save it to your account. So I am logged in um, onto my account right now, and I have a number of, um, of files that I've saved. Yes, uh, I'm seeing a message in the chat, Ruth, that, that the labels don't um, update automatically. So that is a feature that is is on our roadmap. There's a lot of features that we want to be adding to, to the charting tools, and that is one of them as well. So what I want to share with you is this chart, and you can see a number of the things in the chart are covered up. So I'm going to do a uh, uh, an activity of a slow reveal graph. If you have not been to slowrevealgraphs.com, go check it out. There's a wonderful math educator in, uh, who is in the Boston area. Her name's Jenna Laib, and she has created slowrevealgraphs.com. I'm going to put that in the chat so you can go check it out. And then I will show you where you can find this if you want to use it with students. Slowrevealgraphs.com. But check it out here. What I think is really nice is there is a bar chart here, a column chart, and all these green things are covering up information about the chart. And the first thing that I can do, I've clicked on the table and this black tab appears. And what I'm able to do with that table of data, I'm going to uh, I'm going to shrink it so the bottom row goes away and the chart is going to update in real time. So as I do this, we can see how the chart is changing from one category uh, to the next. And I think that's a really nice feature of how students can engage with a slow reveal graph is asking them at this point, what do they notice and wonder about the graph? They can see how it's changing, right? So students may notice that the red is getting smaller. The blue seems to be getting bigger. It might be hard to make uh, that kind of like orangey color under the blue is also getting bigger. So just this, this observation by making changes to the table and the chart changing in real time, I think is a powerful tool. So then I might show that on the y-axis, we're going zero to 100, and you'd ask students to make a bunch of predictions here. Again, there's a whole wonderful like protocol of how to engage students in a slow reveal graph at the website I put in the chat. So go, go check that out. Then I might show the bottom, and the bottom, as I zoom in, you can see is 2010 to 2020. So this is a, a change from 2010 to 2020. Again, asking students what does that give them more information to make a prediction about this graph. This green, so these green boxes that I'm covering up are custom polygons. So in the in the polygon section, you can you can create a custom polygon and change the size of it. So I use custom polygons to cover up information about the graph. I can click on this and we see the data in the chart. And it seems like the A is the red one getting smaller. H was getting a little bit bigger. Um, the G was getting significantly bigger in terms of percentages of itself. So students could think, what do they notice and wonder here? Make some predictions about the graph. And then as I zoom out a little bit more, I've defined what those categories are. I will zoom in because I know on a webinar it's hard to see. But you can see this is the racial and ethnic uh, diversity of of something, right? And so this is how people identified themselves in the 2010 and 2020 census in the United States. And so you could have a good conversation about that. And then the final reveal is this is the state of Nevada. And so there were significant changes in the racial ethnic uh, diversity of Nevada from 2010 to 2020, which had a big impact uh, on the election as well. Um, so this could be a good uh, a good conversation to have with students. This slow reveal graph is part of a full lesson plan in mathagon.org slash tasks, which is, I'll, sh um, I'll search for it here, racial and ethnic uh, diversity in the United States, 2010 census and 2020. And so you can click on that. Here's the whole lesson plan. There are links to uh, the website of the census where students can, can, can go find their information um, and it talks about the opportunity for students to notice and wonder, all sorts of activities here on a slow reveal graph. Uh, and there's a link at the bottom 
or somewhere in here to slow reveal graph. There it is, slow reveal graph. So an awesome site to go check out if you're not familiar with it. So those are some of the charting tools, um, which is certainly a big part of data science. I also want to explore um, some ideas of, of data collection and probability and mean, median, mode range and box and whisker. So I'm going to change gears and go down that road a little bit. Under the file section, I just want a clean polypad. One way to do that is if I just click on polypad at the top, that'll get me to a clean polypad. Um, I also, under library, there is that button that will give me a clean polypad as well. All right, so what I'm going to do here is put, uh, let's put some dice on the canvas. I'm going to do 10. So I go to probability and data, coins, dice, and spinners. It's really easy uh, to copy tiles. So this is a tile on the canvas. I can copy it with the copy op option down at the bottom. You can also make a copy of a tile by just using the C button on your keyboard. Certainly uh, Command C, Control C copies things from one site to another. But on Polypad, if you just do a C, that'll also make a copy. So I've made five. I selected all of that and there's 10. All right, so there are are 10 dice, I can spin them all at once, which is kind of fun. And I might want students to make a prediction of if they roll these 10 five times, what numbers are going to appear. So I need, I, I would now like to add a table to the canvas. So under charts and statistics, here's a table. So I'll put that on the canvas and I'll label this number and prediction. I need another column here. So if I click on this, I just use this black tab and I'll say actual. Oh, I missed the A actual all right and then we'll go we need to add some add some rows here because we're going to predict one two three four five and six i'm just making this from scratch to show you how some of the tools work if you were doing this in, with students you might want to have this pre-made for them uh, and maybe um, i might want students to predict 50 roles here so i could add some instructions predict 50 roles and so even you know for elementary students to think about their prediction and even making sure that all their predictions add up to 50 is a good uh, task practicing some arithmetic skills. Six eights is 48. So let me just make this a nine and this a nine. So there's my prediction of what I think is going to happen. And then I'm going to take all these dice and I'm going to spin them. Now I think there's great power in uh, these probability tools where students actually have to click spin or, or randomize and roll them and see the results. There are lots of sites out there that are really quick to generate a data set. I could go to sites and say, roll a dice 50 times and give me all the results. And I could go through and I could count up how many twos, how many threes and so on. But I think for students to spin them, to roll them and actually see what happens causes them to believe in the numbers a little bit more and feel like they're controlling what's happening, not a code that spit out a whole list of, uh, of numbers one through six. Certainly there's there's a code going on here to spin them all, uh, but I think when students can see it, 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 it uh, adds to their engagement and excitement of the activity. So now I got to count the number of ones that I got. Even just the process of counting them is helpful for students. How they're seeing that there's three ones could be a good conversation to talk about. Two twos. I didn't get any threes. I got a four, no fives, and four sixes. And then I'm going to put a chart on the canvas. And so let's do a column chart again. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And I'm going to attach this table to the chart. And so I can see the red is what I've predicted. And the blue is where I am after 10. So I could roll it again, spin them all again, and add, like, add to my data. So even just for, you know, for kids who are practicing addition facts, seeing that there's two here, and adding that to get five, this is now a three. I now have two threes. And you can see as I change the data, the chart is changing in real time, which I think is uh, a great visual for students to see. And now I got three sixes. So four and three is seven. So I'm almost already at the number that I predicted for sixes. Let's see what happens on this one if I get past it. I did, I'll just finish this off. That is seven and what is that? Five. I got two more threes, so that's four. I didn't get any fours that time. Two fives is three and nine sixes. 
right? And if I'm doing this in class, maybe when all students are done with their 50, we could put all our results together and make a chart of the whole class and see if six really is outperforming all of the other numbers across the class, or was this just something particular that happened in my 30 role so far? Right, so I think that that conversation too can be really powerful about what happened on your 50 as we put them all together. Let's see how the data changes. And you could do it in the same way. You could have a table on your canvas that is projected to the class and it might start as a student shares. Maybe if I were the first, the first student to share, the six might be much higher than all the others. But as other students share and as, you know, if 20 students share all of their 50, that's a lot of roles, right? And so then you might begin to see the blue bars become about the same height, which I think could be a, a powerful activity for students to do. So that's kind of fun. Um, we also could, could do this with, with different dice. So what, what I want to share is under coins, dice, and spinners, I was showing you a standard, um, a standard die with six sides. We also have a polyhedral dice, so an eight-sided die, a 12-sided die, a 20-sided die. You can spin them all at once, and you could have all sorts of great probability simulations with, with those dice. We have non-transitive dice, which are six-sided dice, um, but this one has five threes and a six. This one has twos and fives. These are the classic non-transitive dice. And this one has five fours and a ones, and I could roll all those. Uh, if you want to learn more about non-transitive dice and some of the probability tools here, I'm going to open up mathagon.org slash teachers in a new tab. And uh, again, you can get there just by clicking on four teachers. And under events and webinars, I did a whole probability webinar uh, sometime in August where the whole theme of that webinar was about exploring probability. So I've just shared a few of the probability ideas but go check out the Exploring Probability webinar if you want to learn more about non-transitive dice and some of the other probability tools that we have. While I'm here on the Four Teacher page, uh, there are some webinars from late August, Back to School Secondary and Back to School at the Elementary level. That was more of an overview of Polypad, all of the categories. Again, tonight we're just on data science, but you could go here and explore all, all the geometry tools, all the number tools, all the teacher tools. And the last thing to show before I dive back into the data science tool is under tutorial, there are tutorials on how to make uh, classes. So you can have a teacher account and you can have students join your teacher account. You can share polypads with students through a URL. You can share them through Google Classroom. You can share them to Mathagon classes. So many ways to share content with students. So we have a whole suite of teacher tools that you can go explore. Of course, there was a webinar on all the teacher tools. And the final plug for our, um, our tutorials is on Polypad. I'm now back on Polypad. I just clicked on Polypad at the top. There are also tutorials on all the Polypad tools. So the tutorial page I just showed you was about the teacher accounts and having students join. But if you just want Polypad tutorials, I'm under tiles. Down at the bottom, I click on tutorials and it brings me to the task page, but it's just filtered by the tutorials. So each category of tiles on Polypad has its own tutorial. So if you, want, if you want to learn more about the data and science tools, you could go to using Polypad Probability and Data, and there's an overview of a lot of things I've been talking about tonight. So that is there. But let's go back and do some more math, all right? I want to explore mean, median, mode, and range. This is something that I think too often students are just, here's the definitions, Here's how you find them. Go calculate. And just calculating a whole bunch of mean, median, mode, range without a whole lot of deep thinking about what the mean, median, mode, and range are. Certainly at some point we want students to be able to do the calculations, but I also want them to develop deep understanding about how do we visualize the mean of a set of numbers? What is the median telling us? And so here's an activity that the dice could be helpful with. So I have 12 on the canvas. I'm going to spin them all and then put them in order. So let me uh, just arrange these in order. One and one, two, two, three, three. Bear with me as I do this. Four, four, a couple fives, a five and a six. 
My students often groan when they're doing mean, median, mode, range, and I give them a data set on a piece of paper, and then they have to rewrite them in order. They kind of find that like a laborious task. This feels kind of fun, like moving the dice around, spinning them, seeing what you get. So uh, I think a lot of the virtual tools that we have are very inviting and engaging to students. It can take some of those tasks that, um, you know, just add a little fun and levity to the task. We had to put these in order. All right, I put them in order, and now I want to create a visual model of the mean here. And so I'm going to go to the drawing tool and just put a straight line on the canvas just to organize my work a little bit. And I'm going to go to the number section and put a, uh, the corresponding number of number tiles under each of the numbers that I roll. I'm going to be using the C button a lot on my keyboard to make copies. So there's one, one. I can select all of them and make a copy. Here's a three. Copy that one. And again, this is not something I would do in class and have students watch. I'd have students be doing it, right? So I'm, I'm showing you how these tools could be used, but the goal is for students to be doing this and engaging with the mathematics on their own, not sitting on a webinar watching your teacher do it, right? But I, I'm sure you get that idea. So here's fives, five, and let me just make a six. So there's the numbers that I rolled. And um, one great visual of the mean is taking all the all the data points you have and balancing them out, balancing them out, arranging them into stacks that are the same height. So I could take all these and I'm going to copy it just so I have my um, original number tiles at the top. I'll change the color here. And then students just have the task of like making all the piles the same height. So I'm balancing them out. We'll see what happens as I do is here's three. I can move these three over here. I'll move these three over here. Let's see what else we got. We got one more, and then I got four left over. So it seems like I have uh, 12 stacks of three with four left over. So those four have to get split up um, into the 12, right? So I could kind of think about each one going with three. I could maybe change different colors here. If, if students had a, a hard time thinking about what happens with those four, I could make each set of four maybe its own color to show that that one on top of it is being split up amongst those three. And there we could get to the idea that the, that's the same color. We could get to the idea that the mean here is three and a third, right? That that uh, piece is being split up into those three. So I think I had 12, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got 12 of them. Awesome. So that's a nice visual, I think, of having students make meaning, no pun intended, of what the mean is finding of a set of numbers. It's taking all of the numbers and trying to balance them out so they're all the same height. Another way to show this with the tools on Polypad, which I think is, is cool, um, let me just do this one more time. I'll make these blue here, right? And one option that you might have noticed when I selected all of these tiles, there's a merge tile option at the bottom. And so if I merge these tiles, it's going to put them all together into one group of tiles with this black handle that I can try to, to uh, arrange into different rectangular arrays or non-rectangular arrays. This is a great tool for students to explore factor pairs of numbers. Um, again, on mathagon.org teachers, you can go watch a webinar on numbers where I dive into this in great detail about how those how these number tiles can help students make make meaning of numbers but here I'm trying to split all these merged tiles into 12 groups and so what I could do I'm going to turn on a number grid here under grid settings a number of options for a number grid there's a question mark one which is always kind of fun but I want I want this because I want to split this into groups of 12 and so you can see here this is 5 10 12 and what that is showing me is each group is a group of three with one left over so now i could take these and i could split them and i could pull these four apart right and then pull those apart and make the same picture that i have up at the top but what is really powerful i think this merge option that i'm doing it's adding them all together right that merge was adding them all together and then when i split them up into into groups of 12, I'm dividing by 12, right? So I'm showing visually why when we find the mean of a data set, we add them all up and divide by the numbers that we have. And 
I, I think doing a few examples like this is powerful for kids. I had a few students last uh, last school year when they were doing uh, the mean on Polypad, they kept going back to Polypad and they built the numbers with the number tiles and they merged them together and they split them into groups. And for some students, they needed to keep doing that until they had abstracted the idea, um, which is is great. What a wonderful tool where students go to the tool to, to, to model the meaning that they have of the idea and they keep doing it on their own until they've abstracted the idea on their own terms um, on their own timeline is is great and then certainly here i could find the median one two three four five six the median is three we could talk about what number comes up the most is three and five and the range is five is uh but uh, a great visual for the mean of a data set here i think is really cool the last thing i want to show about mean median mode range is i did this sort of as a after a couple days of working with mean, median, mode range, I did this as a, as a warm-up in class at some point last year, and it showed me that my students didn't quite have a deep understanding yet of mean, median, mode range. So here's what I did. Under File, there are some pre-made polypad canvases. So all of these are ones that I've made in my library. I got a lot. But all the way at the bottom, there are examples and templates, some polypads that we have pre-made that we thought could be helpful for teachers. And under probability and data, I'm going to open the one that is 100 dice. And so I did this a few times in class, and I spun all of them. And it's just kind of nice to see. And then I, I asked students on their own and then in groups to predict the mean, median, mode, and range. And they did this a few times. And then I said, OK, you, you have one shot to get one of them right. You only need to get the mean right, the mode right, the range right, mean, median, mode, range. I, there's one I missed. They had to predict either the mean, median, mode, or range. And it was good feedback for me that a lot of students, or not as many students as I thought, predicted the range. Some of them tried to predict what number would come up the most. Some of them tried to predict what the median would be, right? But in every time that I roll these, I've done this, this hundred a few times, I've always gotten at least one, one, and at least one, six. And some students were skeptical of that. Uh, this was in seventh grade, so we didn't go through the, um, the detailed probability of what's the probability of not getting a one and uh, or, or not getting a six, right? But those students that weren't quite ready to say the range is the most definitive answer that they want to say was telling me that they didn't have great understanding yet of the mean, median, uh, mode, and range. So I thought that was a good activity for them as well. And then finally, a box and whisker plot, which I, I, I saw someone just mentioned in the chat. So let's, let's show where I think um, Mathagon can really be helpful with box and whisker plots. So I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to do 20 um, dice on the screen. Uh, where am I? Probability and data, coins, dice, and spinners. Here's one. I'm going to copy them really quickly. I'll make five uh, and then copy this and make four of them. And I think while I could have had this made ready to go, I also think it's nice to see in a matter of 12 seconds or so, I can get 20 dice on the screen and I can roll them all. I've really struggled over the years teaching box and whisker plots. I found that my students didn't have a great understanding of what they were showing. Constructing them was tedious for them, making the, the number lines and, and lining them up. Um, I could have done a lot better and I'm excited to do a lot better job this school year as I use these tools on Polypad to help me. So I've, I've rolled 20, and I'm putting them in order. Again, uh, very four, five, and six. I mean, this is a great data set to get for our box and whisker. Oh, I got my fives and fours backwards, right? Talking too much while trying to order things at the same time is tricky after a, a full day of teaching, right? Putting things in order is a challenge. And you can see I left out some fours. All right, let me be quiet and try. Those are the fives. I think those are the sixes. There we go. All right, I've got them in order, almost. And now I'm going to find, I'm going to split them into four equal groups, right? So even just to start with kids, before you've talked about a box and whisker, and what it even means, just talking about art, let's split them into four equal groups. And so, of course, I, well, oh, I don't want to upload an image. I picked a number 20 for the purposes of this webinar. It makes it nice and easy. It's four groups of five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, and hopefully there's five. Right. So we found the median. The median here is four. We have found 
the upper quartile, I'm doing the five number summary, that's between five and six, so that's five and a half. We have found the maximum is six. The lower quartile is between three and three, which is three, and the minimum is one. So that's the five number summary. Certainly it would take a little bit more time in class to talk about this than I'm doing right now. But then I'd go to tools and axes and put a number line on the screen. And I want it to go from one to six. So there's my number line one through six. I'm gonna turn on the grid background so it can match up here. Uh, actually, I don't need the grid background. There we go. Cause I want this to be right here at one. And then you can change the width of the number line. And I've uh, played around with this enough to know that the right width I want for these 20 dice is eight. So you can see here is a number line one through eight. I have some halves in here, so I'll create two divisions between each of the numbers, so I have those half marks in here. So there's my number line, and then let's make the box, box and whisker. I actually will turn the grid background on so this can line up nicely with the number line, and I'll move it down a little bit. I'm gonna to go to the drawing tool with the straight line. So four, I don't wanna put four right here, I wanna put where it is on the number line. There's four, here's five and a half, Here's six, here's three, and here's one. Those are the five numbers on the number line. And you may recall if you've done box and whiskers that you put a box here and the whisker here. And that is showing where 25% of the data lives. And so then I think what is nice for kids is I could take these five, not the one, I could take these five and copy them and put them here. Those five numbers live here on the box and whisker. These five numbers, live here. I got to kind of squeeze them in, right? I think for kids, it's, it's, it's confusing to think about these are different sizes on the number line, but they're containing the same amount of data points. So to be able to take these actual numbers that I rolled and put them where they go on the graph is building that idea. This box is bigger, but it still is containing five of the numbers that I rolled. It fits right in. But I love that I got five sixes for the purposes of this webinar because I gotta stick all these sixes in here. I gotta fit six of them here, or five of them here, right? And that's showing me where the data lives. I wish I had copied them so I had the data set up here, but you get the idea. And I think for students to do this, they're building that idea that each of those sections of the box and whisker is containing 25% of the data. And then if you wanted to check it, uh, I'm gonna put a table on the canvas. Actually, I'm gonna put, let's see if I can, look at my data that I have here, even though it's all messed up. I just need one column. I don't need a label here. Let me zoom out a little bit so I have a little more room. And I'm gonna to try to type in all the numbers. It looks like I have six ones. One, two, three, four, five, six. I got two twos, it looks like. I got three threes, one, two, three. Five fours, one, two, three, four, five. Four fives, one, two, three, four and five sixes, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. There is a high probability that I messed up entering the data, but let's see, because I can check it with a box and whisker chart. So for the first time tonight, I wanna show you the box and whisker chart. I have showed you the columns, the rows, the lines, the area charts. Let's put a box and whisker up here. And the process is the same. If I click on this table of, of, of values, I drew, I put the blue line over to make the box and whisker. And if I extend it, it should match up with the box and whisker that I have up here. And it doesn't because I clearly messed up entering my data somewhere, right? The box and whisker does not match up. Uh, as I was saying, high probability that I, I messed up entering the data, but in all the ones I practiced, all of these matched up. So we could go through and find the mistake here. Um, maybe I messed up here somewhere and you could uh, find where that is, but I apologize, these box and whiskers are not the same. They should be. If you want to point out my mistake in the chat, go for it. It would be, I would love to hear uh, whether it was a data entry mistake or something else. But I want to close by sharing with you a box and whisker lesson plan that I think really takes this idea to another level. Uh, so let me go to our task page. And the task, uh, let me go to lesson plans is called perceptions of probability or perceptions of likeliness. And so this is a, is a lesson uh, based on an article. There's a link to the article all the way at the bottom by Rick Wicklin. You can go read the article. The, the idea of this is that students would go to this Google form. You can open the Google form and make a copy to your account. I'm gonna do that right now. 
too many ones. Thank you. Did I have too many ones? Awesome. Let me, let me thank you for uh, a person noticing that. Let's see if I can find that and fix it. Where did that go? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe not too many ones. Anyway, we'll come back to that. I, oh, you put six ones. One, two, don't I have six ones? One, two, three, four, five, six. Anyway, I'll come back to that. I, I want to move on. Here is the, um, here is the task. Certainty and uncertainty ranking. So the idea of this task is we have all these phrases in the world. The chances of this is almost even. There's almost no chance this is going to happen. The chances are slight, highly likely, highly unlikely. What do we think about those, right? What, what number would we associate to these phrases? If you hear something is almost even, what do you think uh, like, like the likelihood is of that happening? If you hear the phrase better than even, what do you think the percent chance that that, that would happen is? So in this lesson, uh, students would go through and rank like all of these based on their own perception of what does it mean if something has a little chance of happening. And in the lesson plan, it talks about how you can collect the data in the Google form. Let me go get to the lesson plan again. I think it opened a new tab for me, perceptions of likeliness. So it talks about how to get the data from a Google Sheet into, um, into Polypath. So you can go watch that if you're interested in, in, in doing, doing this lesson with students. But what I want to show you is a polypad that I've I've made here with the data all ready to go. So here's the data just in a in a table in in polypad. So when students fill out the Google form, it puts the data in a Google Sheet. You can copy the data from the Google Sheet and just paste it into a table in polypad. And so I think it's right here. It's a big table. Um, this, I, I had asked about 20 teachers on Twitter when I was writing this lesson plan just to go fill out the Google form, and they did, which was so nice of those teachers. Thank you if you are one of them on this call. Thank you for doing that. And then I'll go to the box and whisker, and I'm going to attach this to the box and whisker. And it's going to make a really big box and whisker that I need to zoom out for. I'll zoom in on a second. Let me just make it, oh, I swiped over. Let me just make it nice and big and zoom in a little bit. And based on the 20 people or so that responded to the data that I asked for on Twitter, here are the results. And what a great box and whisker, right? We could talk about, you know, so each box and whisker contains, each, each whisker or part of the box contains 25% of the answers. So what a great conversation here of notice and wonder. But one feature I didn't share on the other box and whisker plot because I didn't have any outliers was there's a feature here when I click on the box and whisker to toggle an outlier. So I'm going to click on that, see what happens. All right, it shows these little dots. So those dots are the outlier in a box and whisker. And you may recall that an outlier is a number that's one and a half times away. Uh, so this, this uh, distance between these is the interquartile range. And a outlier is a number that is one and a half times away from of the inter interquartile range of this line and one and a half of the interquartile range range from that line. So this is an outlier, right? All these dots are outliers. And so what's 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 surprising here is there's one person on the data for possibly not said like 75%, right? I bet they were thinking of, or for, for probably not. So they said for probably not, they said 75%. I wonder if they were thinking probably instead of probably not. And up here is an outlier, someone who said probable at 35%. Maybe they were switching in their head probable and probably not. So it would make sense here to kind of ignore those data points. And it's really nice to see that by toggling the outliers back and forth, you can have that conversation with students, right? So if we toggle the outliers, I also notice these two are exactly the same. And probable, probably and probable, ignoring the outlier, have the same number of, of responses in each of the of the section of the box of, of the box and whisker. Great variability under improbable, right? So improbable and almost no chance, right? So we could talk with students, what the smaller the box, what's that telling you about? And uh, you know, the the um, in the article that's linked in the lesson plan, it talks about how these use were or these phrases were often used in reports in the military, and there was wide variety on what people interpreted interpreted you know them to mean as we can see here almost no chance and improbable very different things so uh that was good feedback you know 
for the military to have that they need to be more precise in their language because people interpret these in different ways. So that is uh, some fun with box and whiskers. Two last things to share, and then I'll open it up to any questions that people have. Um, one thing I think is, is really interesting in data and statistics is if I pull up 100 coins here, I'm going to go to the probability and data, 100 coins, predicting the longest streak of heads and tails. I did this with my students, and I think four or five was the longest streak that they had predicted. But I could take all of these and randomize them and find the longest streak of heads and tails. And it looks like here's a streak of six uh, stars. Here's four blues. I could do it again and find the longest streak. And there's lots of great um, mathematics in finding the longest streak of, of heads and tails. Here's a five. Here's a five. Students are often surprised to find um, that the the streaks of things in a row are are longer than they think. I'm not getting I'm not getting any really large ones right now. But here's a six. Here's a four. And so again, you know, this ability to take a hundred coins and flip them really quickly and see the results, um, I think, is powerful. Is, is is powerful for students to do and see. We have a lot of uh, features coming soon in the chart and statistics category. Um, we will have the ability to take a table and attach one column or row to the table to a chart. We will have the ability to take a table and attach it to multiple charts at once. Uh, we have new chart types coming like a histogram. We have new data um, options coming like a random number generator. We have some new probability tools coming like a hat where you can put tiles into the hat and then click a button for those to be picked out at random all sorts of new and exciting tiles coming up. I want to close by just going back to the For Teacher page and giving a shout out for some of our upcoming events and webinars. We have a, a guest speaker series that you can find on Eventbrite. So I'm on events and webinars, register on Eventbrite. You found your way to the webinar uh, tonight, so you made it to the data science on Polypad. But look at this amazing lineup of educators that we have joining us for our guest speaker series. Uh, we Our first one was last week with James Tanton, uh, who is right now, um, he is leading the Global Math Week as part of the Global Math Project. Go check that out. But look at these wonderful guest speakers we have coming up. Uh, Simon Singh, Sunil Singh, Nikki Newton, Mary Kemper, Maria Del Rosario Zavala, Dan Finkel, Katronia Ag, Desiree Harrison, and Jennifer Suh all from now through May. So I'm really excited for what um, these folks are going to be sharing about their thoughts about math education and math in general. So come join the guest speaker events. We have a Mathagon webinar with Dr. Nikki Newton on exploring algebra. And then we have a behind the scenes. Some of our, our, our coders and engineers are going to talk about how they have developed Polypad. And then later on this fall, we'll add the rest of our our Polypad webinars to this series as well. But go check that out. I just saw a question in the chat about where I got the box and whisker lesson. Let me show you that. I'll go to um, for teachers. Yep, we can leave this. Lesson plans. It was called perceptions of likeliness. So I just searched for perceptions here and that came up. So uh, hopefully that'll answer that question. A few last plugs and then I will uh, end the webinar and open it up for questions. Um, also on the teacher page are all the past past webinars. If you want to learn more, go check those out. I didn't really show off any of the teacher tools tonight. If you want to make classes and add students and share polypads with students, go check out these tutorials. Here's our task page. And if you filter the task page just by tutorials, you'll see all the polypad tutorials. All right. So that is the Exploring Data Science webinar. I will um, wrap up my, my sharing and open it up to anyone that's got any questions about data science in general or just Polypad in general. I will happily stay on and answer any questions people have. Um, but officially, thank you for still being here. If you're still with me, I'll take that as feedback that there was something of value and a good use of your time because you could have logged off any time. So thanks for, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for your interest in Mathagon. Uh, and if you're not giving us a follow on Twitter, please do so. That's where we often post updates about what is um, any of the new features. 
That's at Mathagon, uh, Mathagon Org on Twitter. I'm at David Porus. Uh, I'm going to put the Mathagon handle again. I might have put a dot in there the first time. It's just Mathagon Org on Twitter. All right, so thanks for coming. Have a great night. I really enjoyed sharing these, these tools with you on data science, and I, I hope you found some ideas of ways you can use this with your students in school. Thanks very much. Have a great night.